So I just want to, first of all, thank you, Stephen, for those kind words. Marinus, thank you for those kind words also. I really value the work you're doing. And it's really an honor to have a chance to talk with you this morning about the work that my colleagues and I have been conducting for the last 40 plus years. Um, and I need to just mention a couple of quick things about this. The work that I'm describing is really the result of uh, many passionate, caring, disciplined people contributing to what I think is um, uh, an approach to early intervention that shows considerable promise. And um, I have to say that, that this work also has uh, roots here in, uh, in England and in and London in particular. I, uh, as I'll mention in a moment, there are roots to John Bowlby and an ethological approach to understanding early development and our cross-species drives to protect our children. I think that um, attachment theory has played uh, a seminal role in the design of the intervention and my own personal thinking about how we might approach um, the prevention of bad things happening to, uh, to families and children. Um, I actually personally began getting involved in this work uh, when I was uh, a very young person finishing up undergraduate school in Baltimore. I had actually worked with Mary Ainsworth as an undergraduate and done coding on her attachment studies in Baltimore. Um, and I was a product of the 60s. I thought if we could just help poor preschoolers get off to a good start, that so much would be prevented in terms of their being able to function in elementary school and later on in society. So I went to work in an inner city daycare center and um, it soon became clear to me that a lot was happening to children that were, uh, that had preceded their experiences in my classroom. One little boy couldn't speak. He was, uh, he could only gesture. His mother was a drug addict and a, an alcoholic and he had been abandoned to friends in the drug culture and was being cared for by a heroic grandmother. Another little boy in my classroom couldn't sleep at nap time. And we discovered that he couldn't sleep at nap time because uh, when he slept, he wet himself. And if he wet himself, his mom beat him. And so it was these kinds of experiences that led me to realize that uh, we needed to start earlier and we needed to do something with parents. But I also realized that what was happening to parents was not simply a function of their own personal experience in early, uh, in when they were growing up. It had to do with the kinds of resources and conditions that they were having to contend with in their immediate environment. This slide looks very much, this little corner store looks, uh, looks very much like the corner store that was right across the street from my daycare center in Baltimore. We talked in the daycare center about the importance of eating healthy diets, but there were no uh, grocery stores with fresh fruits and vegetables for miles around this neighborhood. Uh, the housing stock was terrible. The park where I'd take children for play, well, there were alcoholics, drug addicts, needles on the ground. Um, I had my car stoned on the way to work by gangs of kids. It was just unsafe. So to try to protect oneself and one's child in those kinds of environments poses considerable challenges. And um, so I realized also at that time in my life that I knew not enough to really make a difference. But those experiences in Baltimore taught me that yes, early experiences do matter and that there is an opportunity to build on this, um, this instinctual drive that we as human beings have to protect our children 
that may hold a, a clue for how we might make a difference. But also, we needed to be very thoroughly attuned to the kinds of conditions that families have to contend with in crafting any kind of a, an effective intervention. Um, so after going to graduate school and studying human ecology with Uri Bronfenbrenner, I, with my colleagues, developed what is now known as the Nurse Family Partnership, or here in the UK, the Family Nurse Fam Partnership. I love the fact that you in the, in the UK have put families first. Um, it's a program of prenatal and infant and toddler home visiting by nurses that focuses on low-income families in which the mothers are bearing first children. And we did this, we focused on this transition to parenthood originally because there was, um, we were thinking that shifting, shifting roles would create um, uh, vulnerabilities on the part of mothers that would make them more receptive to offers of help. But today we also realize that there are uh, neuroendocrine changes, massive changes that are going on in mothers themselves that uh, also are involved in restructuring maternal brains to fulfill their, their evolutionarily driven um, uh, mandate to protect their children. So um, there is an underlying neurobiology that Marinus was alluding to earlier that is critical involved in this particular point in human development. We think the program, as Marinus has indicated, has had uh, replicated effects with different populations living in different contexts that give us confidence that this is something that is really worth pursuing. And one of the reasons we think the program is showing consistency is that we've tried to be really clear about what it is that nurses are um, trying to accomplish and how they might go about doing this. Um, and I think that it's critical, it's yes, nurses, if you talk to people around the world about this program, they'll say nurses are heroes. And there's no question in my mind that nurses are heroes. But if you talk to, if you talk to nurses, they'll say that the real heroes in this are the parents, the mothers, who've had to contend with often unimaginable, unspeakable sometimes, um, adversity, torture, and, um, and it's the parents whose lives and who are the heroes in this. And we need to, in some ways, what, the, what we hope to do at this particular point in human development is to activate and support this powerful drive to protect one's child. The intervention is also strengths-based. I need to mention that because especially um, throughout the world as we've um, developed the program now, people will say to us that they really love the fact that the program is looking for strengths on the part of mothers and not going in with a critical stance. Um, I think that that is um, a critical feature and I want to um, emphasize how, the, how nurses have played a, uh, an, a, a systematic and deep, deep role in shaping the intervention that I'm going to be talking about here. The nurses have three major goals. The first is to help women improve the outcomes of pregnancy by helping women improve their prenatal health. The focus is on things like prenatal tobacco use, alcohol, illegal drugs, um, identification of emerging obstetric complications, to have those problems treated more promptly and reliably so that they won't affect the developing fetal brain. The second major goal is to help parents improve their children's subsequent health and development by helping them provide sensitive, responsive, competent care for the child in the early years of life to set in motion a process of secure attachment and growth promotion on the part of parents in supporting their children's cognitive and language development, helping parents gain satisfaction out of, um, out of providing 
seeing the, the, the rewards that they can, they can observe in their children's affect and developmental accomplishments and their mother's own feelings of competence in being able to manage increasing adversities in their lives. The nurses, the third major goal is to help parents become, to improve their own health, but also to um, create a more stable economic environment for their families. And critical in all of this is planning the timing of subsequent pregnancies. Um, so the nurses focus on helping women complete their educations, find work, and again, critically, planning the timing of subsequent pregnancies. A critical theory in all of this is self-efficacy theory, helping women identify small, achievable objectives that can be accomplished between visits that will reinforce their, uh, their growing sense of mastery in coping with adversities in their lives. The, Nurses also systematically involve fathers and grandmothers and other, and other family members and friends in the family network who can play a role in supporting the goals and objectives of the program and the mother's sense of security. And, um, and also nurses link families up with other needed health and human services in the communities. N nurses are critical to all of this, of course, but they can't do it alone. And so they work with primary care providers, uh, mental health treatment uh, services, substance abuse treatment services. They assess families in, in, in obtaining housing, emergency food assistance, all of those kinds of basic survival needs that families have to contend with, nurses address through the, through the intervention. Now we've tested the program first in three separate randomized clinical trials in the US over the last 42 years. First with a, a sample of primarily low-income whites living in a semi-rural community in upstate New York. At the time we began this study, we wanted to focus on those who were more vulnerable, but we didn't have a clear idea about what vulnerability actually might look like. So we registered, we actively recruited women who were poor, who were unmarried, and who were teenaged. But we allowed anyone in the community bearing a first child to register in the, in the, in the program, uh, in the trial, because we didn't want to create a program that was stigmatized as being only for the poor or for people with problems. So 15% of that, the 400 families enrolled in this study, had no risks, none of the the sociodemographic risks that we've identified and that Marinus just listed in his presentation a while ago. 90% um, of the sample was, was white. And many of the findings from our first trial were very promising. And many people in the US said, gee, you got a program that works, you need to make it more widely available. We took the position that we ought not to do that, that instead we needed to hold off we needed to see whether the program effects would uh, replicate with minorities living in a major urban area first. So we took four years and raised nine, from nine fun funding sources to raise the money to conduct a second trial in Memphis, Tennessee with a, with a sample that was essentially 90% African American. But this time, but one of the things you'll see in a moment is that the benefits in the Elmira trial were truly concentrated where there were overlapping sociodemographic risks. So we actively recruited in our second trial families where there were overlapping sociodemographic risks. And the, um, uh, we registered this time 1,100 or so women for the prenatal phase of the trial. And because we were paying for this intervention and the research, all out of research dollars, we followed up on only a, a predetermined smaller sample, 742, turns out, uh, followed uh, postnatally um, in this design. Um, and then more recently, those findings were also replicating many of the beneficial effects that we found in the first 
trial. And um, so it gave us greater confidence. But many people in the US came to us, they were home visiting, was starting to really catch on. And they came to us and said, you know, this, you got a, you got a very good program here, but you know something, you could do an even better job if you were to hire people from the community to do this, because they are closer to the families. There's a reduced social distance. They'll be able to do an even better job. And there were many para, what we call paraprofessional or community health delivered home visiting programs in the US at the time. So we said, well, you may be, you may be right. Let's test it. Let's conduct a trial where families are randomly assigned to receive nurse home visiting based on the um, NFP model, paraprofessional home visiting based on a version of the NFP model, or randomly assigned to usual care. Um, and so I'm going to share with you some of the major findings that have come out of these trials. But let me also just um, let you know that in all of the trials, our usual care groups were received more than what was usual care in the community. Um, for example, in the Elmira trial, all of the mothers received free transportation for prenatal and well child care. The children were screened for regu uh, regularly for sensory and developmental uh, vulnerabilities and, refer and referred for further evaluation and treatment. A similar kind of uh, approach was used in our, our um, Memphis trial, and the same in, in, in Denver. Um, and of course, you know a little bit, I, I think about the, the quality of our health and human service system in the US, and um, we are deeply envious of the system here in the UK, in spite of the fact that I know that it's under assault right now with uh, reduced funding. Um, these are the findings, some of the key findings where we see replicated effects on at least two, from at least two of the three um, trials. We, do, we see significant improvements in prenatal health, replicated effects on reductions in tobacco use during, uh, during pregnancy, biochemically validated reductions. Um, significant reductions in hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Um, and there are other benefits that in some cases were only measured in one of our trials. For example, we found significant improvements in maternal diet in our first trial, and, but we did not choose to um, measure diet in our second trial. So um, things were going on in alignment with the model in, in all of the programs that gave us confidence that nurses were accomplishing, achieving those objectives that might lead to better pregnancy outcomes. We found significant reductions in children's injuries across trials. Um, and, in, and I should say that the effects were most pronounced where families were more vulnerable. And, um, I think that in all of this work, we need to be careful about distinguishing healthcare utilization from health. It's a huge issue for us. And I think that, um, you know, we could pick up on this. I'll illustrate this in just a moment. We also see significant, consistent cross trial effects on children's early language, cognitive development, school achievement that are, these effects are limited to those children born to mothers who are more psychologically vulnerable. And by that we mean the mothers have lower cognitive functioning, limited sense of control over the life circumstances, and higher rates of dep uh, symptoms of depression and anxiety um, when at baseline. So it's the accumulation of those conditions in the control group that lead to, that are associated with poor developmental accomplishments on the part of the child that are mitigated in the presence of the nurse, okay? We see replicated effects on children's behavioral problems at school entry based on both parent and teacher report. We see significant reductions across trials in children's reports of depression, self reports of depression and anxiety early in adolescence, significant reductions early in adolescence in their, sub, in their use of substances. 
Um, and cross-trial reductions in maternal behavioral impairment due to their, use of, uh, their own use of substances. And consistently across all three trials, we see significant reductions in the rates of closely spaced subsequent pregnancies. That's critically important because closely spaced subsequent pregnancies are associated with poor pregnancy outcomes in subsequent births, but they also mean closely spaced pregnancies tax the parenting dyad and make it more difficult for parents to care well for the firstborn child. So it also means that if, I'm, uh, if mother is working at McDonald's and as a, as a, as a, uh, at the counter and she gets pregnant quickly after the birth of her first child, she, um, she has to drop out of the workforce. But if she, um, but if she um, is able to postpone the, the birth of a second child, it means that she's able to move on to becoming an assistant manager. So all of these kinds of elements of the intervention are designed to reinforce one another and to create pathways for improvements in these domains of functioning. And of course, if families are functioning better economically and have fewer pregnancies, then it's easier for parents to provide nurturing, supportive care to the firstborn child. Um, we see short term, at least, uh, cross trial effects on maternal employment. And, and in the US, in our first two trials, we see significant reductions in cash assistance, welfare, food stamps, and use of public health insurance for the poor. Um, that effect doesn't replicate in our, in our third trial. And after more um, restrictive welfare uh, rules and regulations went into effect during the Clinton administration. This, I'm, going to sh I'm going to illustrate this pattern of results with a few findings. Let me see if I can help you see what's going on here. We found in our first trial, for example, that among the 45% of the women, by the way, smoked five or more cigarettes per day at registration. And in that group, um, because, uh, there was both a reduction in prenatal tobacco use and a corresponding reduction in the rates of preterm delivery that you see on this slide. We also see in the first two years of life that there was a, a trend for there to be fewer cases of um, state verified reports of child abuse and neglect in that segment of the sample where there were overlapping sociodemographic risks, where the mothers were poor, unmarried, and teenaged. These are the criteria used for sample recruitment. And while this is not a statistically significant difference, it's a trend, this is a clinically highly meaningful effect. And so it's, um, uh, and you can, see the, you can see how much more pronounced the effect is in the control group without, without support. This group, by the way, was visited by nurses during pregnancy alone and not followed up postnatally, okay? Um, and we see that in that group of poor unmarried teens, the, the effect of the intervention was further pronounced among women who at baseline had limited sense of control over their life circumstances. This, these are, I'll try not to do too much of this. These are separately fitted regressions of maternal, uh, of child abuse and neglect, whether or not the child was abused or neglected on maternal sense of control fitted separately for the comparison group versus those in, who received the nurse. And you can see that that large difference in um, in the preceding slide, this difference here was really limited to those, or let me say this, more pronounced among mothers, uh, children born to mothers with limited sense of control over their life circumstances. And remember, building self-efficacy is part of the model. So um, this led us 
to hypothesize that the benefits would be more pronounced in subsequent trials, not only on the basis of women's limited sense of control over their life circumstances, but by corresponding limited intellectual functioning and higher rates of depression and, and, and anxiety. We're going to pick up, up on that piece in a moment. We also see, at 15 years after the birth of the first child, that there was a treatment main effect. By that, we mean irrespective of sociodemographic characteristics, there was a, a roughly a 50% reduction in the rates of state verified reports of child abuse and neglect. But this effect was, again, more pronounced where they were overlapping sociodemographic risk, where the mothers at baseline were poor and unmarried, and poor. They were poor and unmarried. In our, um, and we also found in that same 15-year period that, um, that mothers were, um, were less likely to be um, arrested over the first 15 years of life in that group that was poor and unmarried at baseline. And that over the 19-year period following birth of the first child, there was a significant reduction in the rates of self-reported arrests on the part of these the children. This effect, by the, was there, by the way, was there at 19, but the effect, or at 15, but at 19, uh, in the second half of adolescence, the beneficial effect was really limited to females. And we see that, if anything, the intervention control difference wasn't statistically significant in the wrong direction, but there were higher rates of arrests in the second half of adolescents in the nurse visited group compared to their counterparts in the control group among males. And exactly why that is is not entirely clear. Um, there is some thinking that adolescence leads to normative uh, eruptions of antisocial behavior that are in many, in families that are functioning well are li limited to adolescence. We have not been able to do the kind of follow-up that I would like to really see whether there are lifetime differences in arrests and, and convictions. So the story, the, we're, the story is still out on the life course um, in uh, history of, of uh, criminal involvement. These findings led us to our Memphis trial, where we concentrated our sample recruitment on a population that was at very high risk. 92% um, African American, 98% unmarried, 85% of these families enrolled in the study were living below the US federal poverty guidelines. And in the US, that is really, really poor. It means that you have virtually no discretionary income. As a matter of fact, the families in the control group had less than what uh, the, uh, on average, they had insufficient income to cover even the basics. Um, this was a largely teen uh, sample. And the neighborhoods in which families were living were among the very worst in the US. Two and a half standard, 2.4 standard deviations above the national mean in terms of neighborhood adversity. Um, so we are dealing with a, um, um, a population and a sample that is um, at very, very high risk. This sample, this slide shows in the Memphis trial how the, those 1,100 cases were randomized. We originally created, a, uh, had these three groups, a group that would receive tra prenatal transportation and screening for the, the children, uh, a group that would receive the transportation ver, uh, compared to uh, prenatal and a, and, a, and a single postpartum visit, and a group that received transportation, screening, prenatal, and postpartum home visits Within the first six months of the trial, we realized that the, the rates of recruitment into the trial were higher than we could accommodate with the nurses we had hired. So we recreated another group 
that was randomized after that point to receive just the, the uh, transportation for prenatal care. Um, in the, um, for the test of, of uh, prenatal effects, we combined these two groups and compared them to the combination of these two groups. And for the analysis of postnatal effects, we compared group two to group four. Okay. Um, here you see one of the effects that we, um, uh, that I mentioned earlier, this, this pattern of results was replicated in our Elmira trial. Um, we see significant reductions in pregnancy-induced hypertension. We see significant reductions in the numbers of days that children were hospitalized with injuries. And I think this is particularly important because hospitalization for injury is not simply a reflection of, of the, worried, um, the worried well. This is a reflection of children who are um, seriously injured and have to be hospitalized because of, because of injury or ingestions. Um, this slide shows the three children who were hospitalized with an injury or an ingestion in the first two years of life in the nurse visited condition, group four. Notice that these children are all 12 months of age or older. And two of these children picked up things on the ground and ingested them while crawling around. They were mobile. They were creating risks for themselves. This child was uh, crawling on a bed where his mother, his grandmother had been ironing and picked up an iron and put it on his face. This slide shows the corresponding rates or the diagnoses associated with hospitalizations in the first two years of life in the control group. Now notice that these, the, the denominator here is twice as large as what we see for the nurse visited group. Um, but notice that these children, 40% of these children are hospitalized before six months of age. These children are not mobile. They are not creating risks for themselves because of their mobility. Notice the nature of the, the diagnoses associated with these hospitalizations. Head trauma, fractured long bones, um, bilateral subdural hematomas, bleeding under the skull, um, fractured skulls. Another, the, uh, a rehospitalization of this, the child who had been hospitalized earlier with um, bilateral subdural hematomas, fractured skulls, child abuse and neglect suspected. These children were hospitalized for dramatically different reasons and for longer time periods and at much younger ages. And all of these effects, virtually all of them, were limited to that segment of the sample where the mothers at registration fell into this category of having limited psychological resources to cope with adversity. These are the mothers with higher rates or lower, lower they had lower cognitive functioning, higher rates of depression and anxiety, and limited sense of control over their life circumstances. And this index, what we did is we created an index that standardized each of those dimensions that I just, suggest, uh, uh, just described for you, averaged them, standardized them to a mean of 100, and with a standard deviation of 10. And you can see that all of the treatment control difference is limited to the sample in the lower half of the distribution. Now, in our Memphis trial, the rates of, of state verified reports of child abuse and neglect were 3% in the general population over the same time period. We, had, we uh, uh, conducted pre-trial work in this community and found that the rates of official rates of maltreatment were far too low for this to serve as a viable outcome in this trial. So we hypothesized this pattern of results and, um, and it just reminds me, once again, that use of state verified reports of child abuse and neglect is a very unstable and not very meaningful indicator of whether children have actually been abused and neglected. I think it's a general problem that we have 
for all the preventive intervention work that we are doing. I say we, I mean collectively, all of us, because um, again, we need to distinguish between healthcare utilization patterns, social service utilization patterns, and real health. Um, we need generally to come up with much better indicators of neurobiologic functioning early in life that may reflect children's experiences. Um, in the first trial, let me just circle back a little bit. In the very first trial that we conducted, we found that the, uh, that was conducted in, in Chemung County, New York, that had the highest rates of state verified reports of child abuse and neglect in the entire state, of, in the entire, uh, in all of New York State. The, con the economic conditions were very, were very poor. And I should point out that our nurses worked with Child Protective Service workers to make sure that suspected maltreatment was referred to local Child Protective Services to make sure that those cases where maltreatment would occur would not be lost. Nurses are required, just like they are here in the UK, to report uh, suspected maltreatment. It became clear to us uh, in the conduct of that trial that we have a kind of surveillance bias operating in this program as well. And by that I mean nurses are required to report. And ethically, they're, they're going to make sure that children who need these services or need to be protected are going to be protected. I think that in general, as we think about maltreatment, we had to have to keep that uh, issue in mind when we're trying to evaluate interventions. So we were never, we were never able to, we never even sought the records in our Memphis trial to, to look at maltreatment. And the same, we never got the records in our third trial as well. So we've had to rely on other indicators that this child is dysregulated and there are challenges with, care, with caregiving. In both our Elmira and our Memphis trial, I don't have data here to show you, but there were, um, intervention control differences in observed qualities of dyadic interaction. And they're more pronounced in this segment of the samples. And we see um, at, in, the, in our Memphis trial that there are significant intervention control differences in children's dysregulated aggression revealed in their response to the MacArthur story stem batteries. I don't know whether you know about this measure, but it's, a, it's, a, it's an approach that gives children little opening narratives about stories, and then children are asked to complete the stories. Well, what we see is that in the children born to mothers with the lowest psychological resources, the rates of dysregulated aggression in their stories is significantly higher than in the nurse visited correspond uh, in the group visited with that same high risk group visited by nurses. And we see a similar kind of pattern when we look at the degree to which children are incoherent in their narrative responses to these, uh, these um, story, story stems. Um, and again, the rates of incoherence are substantially higher in children born to mothers with low psychological resources. And the nurse visited group has offset that, um, that risk. And you can see that the, the rates are substantially lower for both the intervention and control group if the, um, in the higher resource sample. And these differences are not statistically significant. So it's, that's where the action is. In the Memphis trial, at age 12, we see significant intervention control differences in children's uh, reading and math achievement, directly assessed. But it's limited to those children born to mothers with low psychological resources, living in these neighborhoods and environments where levels of adversity are off the charts. Okay. And when we look at um, um, 
the emergent use of substances at age 12, intervention control differences irrespective of the mother's psycho uh, psychological resources overall in children's emergent use of substances at age 12, corresponding reductions in internalizing disorders at age 12, um, um, again, irrespective of the mother's psychological resources at baseline. And over the first two decades following birth of the first child, there is a significant reduction in mortality among the children for preventable causes. And that includes sudden infant death syndrome, which is reflected right here, injury, and homicide by the time the children reach adolescence. Okay. And because of the program's effect on helping women become more economically self-sufficient, we see significant reductions in children's use, government expenditures for um, food stamps, Medicaid, which is the U.S. Um, health insurance program for the poor, and cash assistance welfare. In our, in our Denver trial, what we see is that in spite, of the case, in spite of the claim that paraprofessional or community health workers would be able to do a better job than nurses, in fact, nurses produce effects that are roughly twice as large as paraprofessional visitors. And it's really, this is not the whole story, but part of it is that families open the doors more for nurses. And even if you control statistically for differences in the dosage of the program received, Nurses produce greater effects because of their greater clinical sophistication. This program requires nursing to be operating at the highest levels of functioning. And um, it's that when we see it's not just a matter of dosage, it's a reflection of the clinical sophistication and being able to weave all of these components of the program together. The program is organized, it's operationalized, it is detailed. There's a, lot of, there's a lot of guidance that's provided to nurses about how to do this. But ultimately, it's up to nurses to make decisions about how they're going to adapt or adjust the content and dosage of the program on a moment-to-moment -moment basis to the particular mother, father, child they're interacting with at that time. So it's this individualization that, um, that is critical to the, really the success of the program. In, Elmira, or in the Denver trial, we see, for example, significant reductions in urine cotinine. Cotinine is a, uh, the major nicotine metabolite. So um, we see significant reductions for the nurse visitor group, smaller non-significant reductions for the paraprofessional group, almost no reductions for the control group. We see at uh, 21 months, significant differences in children's language delays at 21 months, but they are limited to children born to mothers with low psychological resources. You can see that the rates of language delay are, are really very high in the control group, children born to mothers with low psychological resources and they're cut substantially for the group visited by nurses. And we see at 21 months, or 20, or not 21, 12, four years, there is a significant overall difference in, um, in children's language uh, development, but it's limited to, again, children born to mothers with low psychological resources. It's the group in the control group that is, um, born to mothers with low psychological resources, that is the most vulnerable. And nurse visited group, the nurse visited group is performing significantly better than their counterparts in the control group. And we've also created um, in the Denver trial a synthesis of different components of executive functioning and created an executive functioning composite. And what we see for the children is that there is a 
significant improvement in the nurse visited children born to low psychological resource mothers executive functioning compared to their counterparts in the control group. So this gives us a lot of um, hope for the future. I'm going to show you one other slide that I think is um, um, important. And this is, these are survival analyses of uh, timing to the first subsequent pregnancy. Here is the group visited in the control group. Here is the paraprofessional visited group. And here is the nurse visited group. Again, the paraprofessional group is following right in between the control and nurse visited group. And its nurses are, for a whole host of reasons, able to really provide women with good guidance and access to contraceptives to plan the timing of subsequent pregnancies. So um, it was with these findings under our belt, we held off for 20 years from offering up the program for public investment before we wanted to make sure that findings would replicate, that findings would replicate with different populations, living in different contexts, at different points in US social and economic history, under different um, policy contexts. And we wanted to uh, know that findings would endure before offering the program up for public investment. But in 1996, we were invited by the US Justice Department to set up a program in high crime neighborhoods in the US. And it was with a lot of apprehension that um, I endorsed that work. And um, we began a process of careful community replication of the program in the US, in which we paid a lot of attention to making sure that organizations and communities were well prepared to deliver the program. We developed detailed educational and consultation models for nurses. We operationalized the program in visit-by-visit -visit guidelines meant to be adapted to um, in families' individual needs. We created a consistent information system that monitored program implementation in maternal and child health. And that information was then used to assess program performance. And that information was used to guide continuous quality improvement. And so today, the program is operating in the US in over 300 communities, serving 50,000 families a year in the US. And then um, uh, 10 or 12 years ago, I'm kind of actually longer, uh, um, maybe more than that, we were invited first by the Dutch and then the English to replicate the program here. And we developed a model for international exportation of, the, of replication of the program. And we took the position that we didn't know whether the program would work in new contexts. The cultures are different. Families may have different attitudes about caring for their children. Would this drive to protect children hold up in Aboriginal contexts or uh, Roma families in, in Eastern Europe? Um, say nothing about even more dramatically different um, uh, cultural contexts. So we took the position that we don't know and that if we were going to work with other societies, we needed to carefully adapt the program to their populations, their context, and then to conduct a small pretest and small, uh, uh, a small scale trial of the program to see whether it was really feasible. And then if it was um, that, we, if it looked like it was really going to work, then we would really urge our, our uh, collaborators, the government is almost, almost always government, to invest in a randomized clinical trial of the program in those new settings so that we would have some estimate about what the added value of the program would be in those other contexts. We felt that that was res the responsible thing to do because in many societies, whether it's Norway or here in the UK, you've got much, much better, well-developed health and human service systems. What's the added value of this program in your context? We needed to know. And so we've been working for the last, um, if, if the program works, as you saw the, the evidence in from uh, Holland, 
that give us a lot of, uh, of reassurance that it can work in other contexts. We've been now working in, uh, in here in the UK, in England, Scotland, Northern Ireland. I know that there are some nurses here from those countries, and I am thrilled that they're here uh, this morning. We've been working in Australia to serve Aboriginal families, now serving 13 uh, communities, Aboriginal communities in Australia, working in Ontario and British Columbia and Canada. There's a, a separate randomized clinical trial going on there. We're working in Norway to serve really vulnerable segments of their population, in Bulgaria serving Roma families, and throughout the US serving American Indians and Alaskan Natives. In all of this, our approach has been um, that the program itself and our capacity to deliver it well will always be a work in progress. That we need to pay attention to where things are not going well. And so we've been doing work now, you know, translational kind of uh, research, looking at um, the, the predictors of participant retention and completed home visits and devising interventions to improve that. We've, been de we've devised and supported the conduct of a cluster-based randomized clinical trial to address intimate partner violence, to support hormonal contraception delivered by nurses in the home. We've developed a new method to support nurses' observations of qualities of dyadic interaction in the home and using that information to uh, guide nurses um, uh, even more effective support of parent dyadic interaction. We've developed an intervention for nurses to deliver in addressing moderate uh, maternal depression and anxiety in the home. We've developed a tool for nurses to use that aligns with the underlying theory and developmental epidemiology of the program to, and the clinical operations of the program to identify proximal and more distal risks and um, to use as a, a, a tool in guiding the delivery of the program called the STAR framework. We have been working to modernize the NFP with new telehealth methodologies and uh, to promote even, we think, better collaboration between the NFP and child welfare and primary care providers. And now in the US we're also developing and testing a version of the program for women who've had previous live births and those who are involved with substance abuse. And in the US, we are particularly concerned about the terrible, terrible uh, opioid epidemic there. Opioid deaths are, uh, opioid overdoses are now the, the highest ca uh, cause of death in the US. They exceed automobile accidents as cause of death in the US. So in either case, we're trying to prevent bad things from happening to mothers and their offspring with this. And in all of this, we try to honor these principles in the design and implementation of the program. And with that, I will um, take some questions. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David, for an inspirational talk. And gosh, how you're developing it wider and wider. Terrific. Questions? Jonathan Green. Um, hello, David. Thank you very much. Um, uh, great considered program over a long time. Um, the, the results uh, make me uh, even more interested in some of the more detailed, fine grain uh, comments on actually the delivery of the program, how much uh, time it, nurse time it takes, how frequent the visits are, what your attrition rates are, uh, what your um, education of your nurses might be, etc. So some more details about how the, act, the program actually works in practice. Yeah. I'm particularly interested in dosage issues. So how often are these families being visited on average and uh, the range of that, and uh, if you've got any dosage effects you could share. So thank you for that question. The, um, I'll, 
We have 62 structured, or 64 now, 64 structured visits that nurses have at their disposal to guide their work with families. Uh, but nurses are instructed to adapt the dosage to the needs of the families. You know, when uh, nurses in the U.S. Have, uh, uh, can, are, are, are unable to carry more than 25 families per nurse, here in the UK, it's probably less than that because of, of just differences in, in, in work, uh, um, um, uh, in their workload and uh, hours of working. But um, from the beginning, we've known that um, you cannot deliver 64 visits over the course of that two and a half year period to caseloads of 25 families. So we've guided nurses to focus on those where the needs are greatest. And so, um, and the rates of, of attrition out of the program are in the first, in the first, uh, we're dealing with uh, rates of attrition of around 50% overall. This is, uh, these are dropout rates and you know, a lot of this has to do with families moving. There's greater transience in the U.S. I don't know what the, 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 um, the corresponding data are here in England or Scotland, but it's less. And the rates of uptake of the program are um, higher here. And I think that it's higher because um, you have universal services. You have health visiting. It's part of your culture. It's not so potentially stigmatizing to have someone come to your home. So all of that makes this kind of service much more acceptable in your context. Um, so the, the nurses, just to give you an, some insight on this, the nurses are asked to visit once a week for the first month after families register in pregnancy. And that's different, by the way, than the way usual prenatal care is organized, where the visits are really bunched up at the end of pregnancy. We try to get to families and have more frequent visits early in pregnancy, because that's when all of the action is happening in terms of exposures to neurotoxins, for example. And we think it's critical that the nurse establish a relationship Everything depends on the quality of the nurse's relationship with, this, with the mother. So getting back in there, understanding mother's needs, her aspirations, her fears, all of that is critical to the success of the program. Um, then the nurses drop back to visit every other week. And then after the week, until the baby is born, and then once a week for the first six weeks after delivery, and then every other week, and then every three weeks, and by the end of the two-year period, the nurses are visiting once a month. Now, nurses are making adjustments to these, these the frequency of visits, depending on their, uh, their observation about the family's needs. So this adjustment of content, adjustment of dosage, is part of the clinical judgment, sophistication, that nurses bring to the table in doing this, doing this work. You know, we've been able to build upon, I think, we, the um, UK government has been able to build upon the wonderful existing systems that you already have in place with health visiting, for example. So um, you, have a, you have a wonderful workforce in health visiting. And so it gives this program a, uh, a leg up in the UK and getting up and running well. So we've learned a lot, and we will continue to learn a lot from our, um, from UK nurses and counterparts in all of this. <coughs> right, one Hello more there. question. Yeah. Oh. Yes, yes, sir. Should I go first? Thank you there. Um, Aidan Phillips from Wave Trust. I was very interested to see the results comparing high psychological resources with low psychological resources. Do you think this evidence provides a strong argument not just for investing more in perinatal mental health services for the parents themselves, but actively trying to encourage parents to look into their mental health during the prenatal period, to try and acknowledge possibly um, childhood trauma, insecure attachment, issues they may not have considered before, rather than waiting for them to come to you? 
Um, I want to make sure that I've understood your question. So um, I do think that these findings um, don't apply to just, you know, this pattern of results doesn't apply to just the family nurse partnership. And that it does tell us that this is a, this is a, um, a population that is um, uh, both vulnerable and maybe susceptible to the positive effects of, the, uh, of these types of interventions in spite of some of these kinds of things that may be uh, heavily influenced by uh, genetics. There is, um, that we may also, there may be underlying this group some fairly high concentration of susceptibility genes. There may be, um, so I don't, we could go, we could dig into this in lots of different ways. I do think that these findings suggest that there is a vulnerable population there if we, if we um, spend the time engaging them in a respectful, caring way that this, um, that they will be responsive to offers of help. But there is often natural resistance and natural apprehension about engaging helpers if they experience those helpers as somehow being judgmental. So it, uh, whatever is done, it has to be done in an open, caring, supportive way. And I do think that pregnancy is an opportune time to do this kind of thing because of all of the changes that I just I mentioned at the beginning of my talk. I hope that answers your question. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, we need to stop now. Can you come back at quarter two, please, and get David at, over the coffee break if you've got more questions. Yes.